Since 2002, fiction writer Cheryl Klein has been the director of Poets and Writers California office based in the Westwood section of Los Angeles. Poets and Writers started in 1970 in New York when our founder Galen Williams received a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts to distribute money to writers who were doing literary events. And our mission is to help writers build their careers and to make literature available to the widest possible audience. And so that takes a few different forms. One of them is publishing the magazine, which includes articles about literary trends, interviews with writers like Joan Didion, a lot of practical advice for writers, like our MFA issue, which um, ranked a lot of different MFA programs is a little bit controversial just because it's a really important topic for writers and the issue before that was about literary agents. The whole back half of the magazine is calls for submission, listings of grants and awards, writing contests, classified ads that are vetted by our editorial staff. So our main office is in New York City and our California office is in Los Angeles. The majority of our time is spent um, administering the Readings Workshops program, which is a small grant program for literary events. Um, we have counterparts who run the program out of our New York office for um, New York State and several cities in the East, and we run the program in California and Seattle. Tucson and Houston. The organizations that apply to us um, sometimes are larger institutions but are often very grassroots, may not be established nonprofits, which is fine. Um, so they just fill out these two page applications that they mail or fax to us. We do have some priorities of events that we think deserve maybe a little extra support, meaning usually that the events reach an underserved population, um, a lot of times in the form of workshops. So for example, there's in LA, there's um, an organization called Hillsides that is a, a group home and school for youth in the foster care system. And we've supported Brendan Constantine, he's a great local poet. Um, He's t taught workshops there probably for the past couple of years that we've supported, and um, he's so great with the kids. <laughs> so, you know, an event like that is something that we probably would give priority to because our funds are pretty limited. And we also do a lot of outreach and follow-up with the writers and organizations we support. We, One of the nice things about being a small organization is we like to be very accessible. We take a lot of phone calls for people who do want to apply to the Readings Workshops program or put on a literary event, or people who really, I, I think they just probably Google us or find us in the phone book um, or something because they basically say, they call up and they sort of say, so you guys po poets and, and writers? And so, okay, I'm a poet and I, I wrote a book and what do I do now? We try to provide technical assistance and that can mean different things. We have several databases um, and we they are all updated regularly. We also have a, a database of writers. Writers will apply to be listed in that and they have to meet certain publication criteria. It's not like Facebook or something where you can just update your own profile. People do update their own profile but then it has to be approved manually. So we want, whether it's writers looking for an agent or a literary magazine or an agent looking for a writer or somebody, a literary presenter looking for a writer to present, we want a certain amount of legitimacy to be somewhat guaranteed um, by what they find on our site and in our magazine. The Readings Workshops program is probably the department that's the most devoted towards making literature available to a wider audience because the grants we provide are very small. They're from 50 to $350 for readings or up to $500 for workshops. But we serve so many writers in any given year. I think it's I think it's about 700 in California um, and probably more than that in New York State and plus, you know, 
more than a handful in the cities that we support. So it's sort of our program that that has the most breadth. We do sponsor several contests. Um, the biggest, most long, long running one is the Writers Exchange Contest, which is run out of our New York office um, most of the time, but we've done it every few years in California as well, and that awards um, one poet and one fiction writer with a trip to New York where they get to meet with literary agents, editors, publishers, uh, other writers. We give a prize called the Jackson Prize uh, once a year, which is a large grant that writers can certainly use to kind of buy time to write. Um, that's $50,000. and um, But the, the catch is that you can't apply for it. It's We have a committee that kind of works in secret, more or less. I don't know how, what their criteria are for nominating or selecting writers, but they're always writers who are, there's a, the grant is intended for writers who are kind of mid, mid-career. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we also list lots of grants and awards, some of which are for writing. Um, sometimes I'll point people to the Center for Cultural Innovation. That's an organization that that offers um, multidisciplinary grants, but including some literary grants. Um, a Room of Her Own Foundation is um, is an organization that gives big grants to women writers who are working on projects. Unfortunately, I would say maybe at least in the last five years that a lot of organizations are just really struggling with funding. It used to be that when community colleges or universities applied to us for a stipend to bring in a reader, it was sort of they were sort of our wealthy organizations. <laughs> they were the ones who probably had a good sized budget for guest speakers and literary events. And that's even though they sometimes have a, a little bit more money than the super grassroots organizations now, a lot of them have just a pretty minuscule budget for guest speakers and readings and that kind of thing. Things like travel costs have gone up a lot if you're talking about bringing in a writer for some type of event and yet the amount that writers are being paid for those events has not really gone up. I mean the amount of our grants has the our maximum grants have gone up a little bit but definitely not compared to the cost of living. Luckily artists have a long tradition of making making a lot out of a little, but, you know, I don't, even though I think that's something that as a community we should be proud of, I also think sometimes people can be quick to use those stories of triumph of like, look at what we did with no resources as it, it can sort of have this um, unfortunate side effect of people then thinking, oh, well, you, we don't need to fund the arts in any way because look, they'll just do it anyway. It's like, kind of a blessing and a curse. Something that I think characterizes the local literary community is something that characterizes LA in general, which is that it's very spread out both geographically um, and in terms of genre and audience. You know, I think LA somewhat recently maybe, um, the kind of avant-garde experimental scene has been getting a lot of momentum. At the same time, you also have a strong spoken word community and as well as um, what maybe for lack of a better term I would just describe as really solid, engaging, um, fairly accessible poetry and fiction being being presented at different venues throughout the city, um, as well as a lot of writers who, you know, at Poets and Writers were really invested in literary presenting, and I know Poetry LA, that's sort of what you guys do and are involved with too, but one thing we realize when we sponsor writing contests is just how many writers are out there writing locally and who you're never going to see at a poetry reading or a fiction reading, um, maybe because they don't know that it exists or maybe because um, 
they're just not interested in that, which is fine. Traditionally, I have thought of poetry as being a much more communal and performative genre, whereas fiction has been on the page. But in the, in the present, I do think that we're seeing an emphasis on fiction and storytelling, which I'm very excited about because I think that having a community of writers and audience members is really invigorating. It's a great chance to sort of see the effect that your work really has on people um, and to interact with people. I mean, writing's always an interaction, but sometimes it's a very indirect one. So it's nice to have have that kind of immediate gratification as a writer that's nice. Some of it is people just like to come together for storytelling. It's a very like, wonderful and ancient thing, but I think you know the the prevalence of podcasts as a kind of medium I think is lends itself well to storytelling and um and fiction. People also know that if you want to bring people to a reading that having a place where they can buy books or buy coffee or view art is also a draw. So you kind of, in the best case scenario, you you get to benefit from each other's shtick. I think that our relationship to space is just changing because there are so many organizations and businesses that are online or at least have a very small physical space. You know, like a little a little office. Um, but we don't need to use space for the same things maybe that we used to. Um, but we still need it because I think we need to come together. I think it's kind of a deep human biological need. I think we're just really kind of negotiating our relationship to space um, and literature gets drawn into that in its own way. Bookstores are certainly much less central than they used to be. Maybe as a result of that though, I think that they're, the bookstores that are surviving um, serve a different function from, I mean, certainly there, there are a place where people go to get books, but they're not, um, that's not maybe their only purpose, they're, or that's not kind of their selling point. They're also places that host literary events, and um, they're places people go to kind of interact. You know, a lot of bookstores have coffee shops and art galleries associated with them, um, and I, I actually really love, I mean, <laughs> besides being kind of a, a coffee addict. I, I also, I, you know, I like to have kind of a nice hangout spot and I like to see different art forms sort of overlapping um, and having more of an exchange. I am mostly a fiction writer. I do write poetry every now and then. Um, and I have a blog which is nonfiction, but I would say that definitely the, the writing that I, is closest to my heart and that I probably invest the most time and effort in is fiction. In a way I've been writing all my life. My mom was a children's librarian and read to my sister and I. I got my MFA from CalArts in 2002 and um, while I was there I wrote um, a collection of connected short stories that were all set in LA called The Commuters which um, was published a few years later by City Works Press which is this great press based in San Diego. They're a, they're a collective. They publish work by members who are outside the collective as well. And that was sort of how I got connected with them. Um, and uh, then I also wrote a novel called Lilac Mines that um, was published by Manic D Press, which is a, a great press in the Bay Area. They sort of have, I think, kind of kind of punk origins, but they publish a lot of different stuff um, and that, that novel came out in 2009 and now I'm working on a variety of other things so it's it's always fun.